The Bhagavad Gita, as you know, is a book of questions and answers. So we'll go over quickly the 17 questions in the Bhagavad Gita that are primarily questions. And I'll focus on one question which will guide us about how we can pursue this balance and what it means. So on the occasion of Gita Jayanti, we had a series of 18 classes on the Bhagavad Gita. So uh, different devotees spoke, but I spoke quite a few classes. So I'm continuing that today. So let's begin. So we are okay. So here we have the Gita itself begins with a question. Hare Krishna, humble way, Hare Krishna. Thank you. So today I was preparing for this Bhagavad Gita class. I was remembering the Atharva classes that you were giving. You know, that was the time when. I got some taste for the Bhagavad Gita. So whatever I speak is like Vrindavan Das Thakur offering something to Krishna Das Kar Sorry, Krishna Das Kar Swami offering something to Vrindavan Das Thakur. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the 17 questions in the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita begins with Arjuna's dilemma. Prachamitvam dharma sammudha chetaha. So that is the underlying question that leads to the entire discussion of the Gita. Dharma in this context is what is the right thing to do? What should I do? Should I fight or should I not fight? So, and in answering those questions, when Krishna makes different points, Arjuna asks different questions. So, when Krishna describes the Nishkam Karma Yogi, and Arjuna asks, what are the characteristics of that Nishkam Karma Yogi? So, that is the second question, which comes in 2.54. Then when Arjuna, Krishna concludes by talking about how the Nishkam Karma Yogi is very shant, he says, so shanti madhi gachyati. Then Arjuna gets confused because Krishna is talking about inner shanti and Arjuna is thinking about outer shanti. So inner peace and outer peace. So he says, Krishna, if you want peace, why are you asking me to fight? If you, so that's the reason for this question, third, third chapter, first question, first and second verses, this is a question. What do you exactly want me to do? Fight or renounce? And then when again Arjuna talks about, Krishna talks about how we should perform work with detachment. Krishna talks about karma yoga which culminates in bhakti yoga. But he emphasizes the nishkam aspect of karma yoga. Then Arjuna asks towards the end of the third chapter that, okay, we may understand this is my duty, but what is it that diverts us from duty? What is it that devi deviates us from the right thing to do? So one thing is that we don't know what is the right thing to do. That, is, that requires intelligence we can say. To know what is the right thing to do. But even after we know what is the right thing to do, it's not easy to do the right thing. So what is it that deviates us? And Krishna answers, that is karma. And that is the third question. That's 336. Then when Krishna answers this, Krishna says that karma is nitya vairi. It is it that karma doesn't specifically refer only to lust. It refers to any kind of selfish or self-destructive desires. Then Krishna says how throughout history, since the dawn of time, I have provided a system of knowledge by which one can counter jnana, counter karma. So jnana to help us counter karma. So the jnana itself doesn't counter karma, but jnana about the process of yoga by which you can counter karma. And Krishna says that I gave this knowledge at the dawn of creation to Surya Dev. Then at that point Arjuna said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Surya Dev is much, much senior to you. So how did you speak to him? So that is the question in the fourth chapter. Then after that, Krishna now talks a little bit more about Jnana. So initially he has introduced the concept of Karma Yoga, but then he goes deeper into what is the Jnana that can help Karma to become Yoga. We are all doing activity, but how can we do activity in the mood of selflessness? For that we need Jnana. So that Jnana Krishna gives, but then, at the end of the fourth chapter, Krishna talks about, therefore, Arjuna, you should fight. Now, this may seem to be like, a, okay, Krishna wants Arjuna to fight. But what Krishna does is, therefore, you fight with the sword of knowledge. Tasmad agyana sambhutam ritstham jnana sinatmana. And so, in the entire chapter, Krishna has not used any word about yuddha. Krishna has said, go to guru and surrender and get knowledge. So Arjuna starts thinking, you know, should I be fighting or should I go to find a guru? What should I be doing? So again, in the fifth chapter, he asks Krishna, what do you want me to do actually? Which is better? Is it action that is better or renunciation that is better? 
Then Krishna describes the process of Karma Yoga in greater detail. Here, so here it is Karma Yoga with the foundation of Jnana much more clearly delineated. And then Karma Yoga involves engagement in the world. Then eventually, when one has pacified the mind substantially, one can renounce the world. And that's the sixth chapter Krishna talks about Dhyana Yoga. And Dhyana Yoga centers a lot on managing the mind. So after hearing this process, Arjuna feels, hey, this process is not practical for me. The mind is very difficult to control. So actually after hearing this process about Dhyana Yoga, Arjuna has two questions, two reservations. One is this process is, this controlling the mind is extremely difficult. So then Krishna is reassuring, he says, it's difficult but it's possible if you follow the right process. Krishna doesn't tell here what the right process is. There's, a, there's like a, the Bhagavad Gita is like a, you know, you have a treasure hunt. So there are clues given. Oh, you go in this direction, go this direction, this direction. So it's like that. So in the sixth chapter, Krishna says, if you follow the right process, then you can attain success. Then Arjuna has another question. Okay, but how long will success take? What if I run out of time? What if I die before I can attain spiritual success? And then Krishna answers, by talking about how spiritual growth is never lost. Talks about how it will continue on. It will stay with us and it will move forward in the next life. So then, and this is the way the sixth chapter ends. And in one sense, till now Krishna has been talking about Nishkam and Anasakti, Virakti. And suddenly the tone changes in the seventh chapter. Krishna begins the seventh chapter not with Anasakti but Asakti. But Asakti to Krishna. Mai asakta manaha partha. So this is what our Acharya says. The transition from Karma Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. So 7th chapter describes Bhakti Yoga. And then uh, sometimes when a speaker is giving a class. At that time they may deliberately make some points which should raise the question. And if nobody asks a question... That means the audience is absent. <laughs> <laughs> they may be mentally absent or they may be physically absent also. If you are on Zoom, you don't know who is there. <laughs> so, Arjuna or Krishna, he drops six terms out of no context in one sense. So, Sadi Bhuta, Daivam, Maam, Sadi Agyam, Like that, he, he, he drops those terms. And then, in one sense, he is checking. Will Arjuna ask about this? So, in, in one sense, in the, most of those terms, they are not referred to before or after. Only for those four or five verses. Two verses in the last cha eight chapter and two verses in the, uh, three, four verses, in, sorry, two verses in the seventh chapter and four verses in the eighth chapter. Of course, there is a whole, in the Upanishads, Adi Bhuta, Adi Daiva, Adi Agnya, or elaborate subject. And Krishna is very terse. He just gives one, one verse definition. One, one, not even one verse, one fourth of a verse definition at times. And many Gita commentators have actually uh, they, have, they have a lot of challenges in explaining what Krishna is trying to say over there. But Krishna focuses on what is relevant. See, that is the expertise of Krishna. Sometimes what happens, a speaker is giving a class and the audience asks some tangential question. So then what do you do? So generally, I, I used to say that, you know, can we stick to questions on the topic? So I was in Australia, New Zealand, especially in New Zealand. So there, the devotees told me, never say something like this. It is because, actually we often use, we, you see Western people are all Western. But every country has its own distinctive culture. Hmm? So uh, Americans are like on the top of the world. They are very aggressive, very in your face. But Australia, and Australia, if you consider, Australians are in your face only in cricket. <laughs> they will sledge and do all kinds of things. But otherwise they are very laid back. So uh, the organizers told me if an Australian asks a question, if it is in the middle of the class, see that as an encouraging sign. See that they are actually being involved. They are interested enough and, cour and courageous enough to ask a question. So then, even if the question is tangential, it depends on the speaker's expertise to get the, get the uh, discussion back on track. So answer the question slightly and then come back on track. So what in one sense here, Krishna only takes the uh, discussion on a tangent, but then he brings it back. So he asks, he brings points which will, which are in one sense tangential to the Gita. But then in that, the last point, that is Antakale Chamameva. Because Arjuna is on a battlefield, death can happen, death can happen anytime, literally speaking. But on a battlefield, death is much more real. It's just one bullet away at any time. 
or in that's one arrow or one sword away. So Krishna focuses on Antakal. That's the eighth chapter. And he talks about there, that is where actually Krishna answers Arjuna's question. Okay, he's talking about Dhyana Yoga and he says the right process will help you to control the mind. But in the eighth chapter, Krishna contrasts Dhyana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. And there's only one verse in the Gita where Krishna says, where Krishna says this process is easy. That is in the Tatsyaham Sulabha Partha. So Sulabha, easily obtained. And that is talking about Bhakti Yoga. That's 8.14. That's where he answers that question. Then after that, now it's fascinating that how sometimes Krishna speaks, goes to a new chapter without any questions from Arjuna also. So Krishna is speaking about Bhakti Yoga. At the 8th chapter he concludes that and he's, he eagerly goes forward and continues about Bhakti Yoga in the ninth chapter. And he continues with Bhakti Yoga in the 10th chapter. And that is where the Chatushloki comes in. Now in one sense, after the Chatushloki, Arjuna speaks that, I accept what you say. You are Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Sarvam Etadritam I accept everything. So in one sense, we can analyze that. If we consider the Bhagavad Gita to be like a, like a class, it is driven by a particular question. But the Bhagavad Gita as a class ends by the 10th chapter. And after that, our question answers after the class. So, <laughs> so why I'm putting it that way, although it's between only one, one person, one, one, one teacher and one student, but it's, it's somewhat difficult to find the link between one question and another question. Just like if an audience is asking a question, now if you try to find out, okay, this question was asked after this question was, is there a link between the two questions? Well, not necessarily. Isn't it different people may be thinking different things in their mind or the same person may also have different questions in their mind which they're just asking one after the other. So the 10th question, uh, the, the, this 10th chapter question is the 7th question. That is what we'll be focusing on in our class. But I just complete the Bhagavad Gita over you quickly. And so here Krishna speaks in the Chatur Shloki Bhagavad Gita about how the great devotees they are, they, are, they are completely absorbed in Krishna. They discuss about Krishna. They delight in discussing about Krishna. So now Arjuna says that, hey, there is nothing about the fighting a war over here. And by now he's clear that our Krishna wants him to fight a war. Krishna has told us so many times. He's clear that he wants him to fight a war. So then Arjuna asks, okay, and how can I remember you in this world? You told me the great devotees remember me. You also told me to fight. So Maam Anusmara Yudhyacha. So how do I remember you in this world? And that is where the Krishna, Krishna introduced the concept of Vibhuti. We will discuss what Vibhuti is. And then towards the end of the Vibhuti Yoga, Krishna explains that I sustain the whole world by just one fraction of myself. So then Arjuna asks, can you please reveal that vision of how you sustain the world, how you contain the world? So in one sense, what Arjuna has spoken earlier, that Pashyame Yoga, what Krishna has spoken earlier, Pashyame Yoga Maishwaram. So now Arjuna says, please, Rupa Maishwaram, please show me your opulence in a form. Not just the knowledge of how you are, you, you, are, you exist throughout the world, how you pervade the world, how you contain the world. But I want to see that. And then Krishna shows the Virata Rupa, the Vishwa Rupa it is technically called. So many times when devotees ask something from Krishna, it is, it is, you know, what is that saying that uh, beware of your desires, they may be fulfilled. <laughs> so what happens is that Krishna, he says, yes, I will show you the Vishwarupa, but I will show you something more. Something which you have not seen. Something which no one has seen. Adrishta Purvam. Something which has never been seen, I will show you. So see what happened, like earlier I said, the the speak the questioner may have a particular purpose in asking the question, but the teacher has a particular purpose in in giving the class and giving the answer also. So the expert teacher what it does is answers the question, but also continues the purpose. So Krishna shows the Vishwarupa to Arjuna, but Krishna also shows something extra, and that is the Kala Rupa. The Vishwarupa has shown many times before. Whom has he shown to earlier? The Vishwarupa. Duryodhan is also shown to Madhuri Shoda. Yeah, thank you. He also shows after the war to Uttanga Rishi. But none of them he shows the Kala Rupa. Now why does he show the Kala Rupa? So Arjuna is hesitant. Should I fight? Should I not fight? So Krishna wants to show Arjuna that it is not you who are causing the death of all these people. By their actions they are meant to die. 
So that's why Krishna shows this this Vishwarup, this Kala Rupa, the Kala Rupa within the Vishwarup. And Arjuna is observing and he is. He is marveling at the Nantam Namadhyam Napunas Tavadim Pashami Vishweshwara Vishwarupa. So I can't see the beginning, I can't see the middle, I can't see the end. I'm seeing everywhere Vish your Vishwarupa. And he knows, he has heard about the Vishwarupa, but suddenly he starts seeing something quite ghastly. Tamstra Karala Nijate Bhayanakani. He sees a, he sees a teeth coming out of the mouth and then there are the warriors entering into the mouth and they are, the warrior's head is clashing against the teeth. Churritai Ruttamangai. Uttamangai means the best part of the body is the head. Churritai means smashing apart. And then, Leli Yase Grasamana. That then the Vishwarupa is actually taking out his tongue and licking the blood that is coming out. Is, what is this? So he asks, Akya hi meko bhavan ugra rupo. He says, who are you? So it is like, see, even when Arjuna surrenders to Krishna, he says, Atvam, Karpani Dosho, Pahataswa, Puchami, Tvam, Dharma Sammuda Cheta. But when he sees the Virat Rupa, that Tvam becomes Bhavan. <laughs> so what is the difference between Tvam and Bhavan? So it's like, you know, somebody call, uh, somebody, in English, there is no difference in second person pronouns. You, it's only you. But in Hindi, we have tu and aap. So we might pick up a phone, Kone tu? And maybe it's our boss, some senior. Huh, kya, aapke kya kar sakta <laughs> <laughs> so, the tu becomes up. So, like that, Tvam becomes Bhavan when he hears about, when he sees this Vishwarupa. But another interesting thing is, he has already identified that this is the Vishwarupa. But then still he's asking, who are you? And it is that actually, when he's seeing the Vishwarupa, he's not seeing Krishna. Krishna shows the Vishwarupa in one sense, Krishna, the whole battlefield itself and Krishna on the battlefield becomes unmanifested. That's why he's not asking Krishna, who is that? There's no Krishna for him to see. So he's seeing the, who Akya Himeko Bhavan Ugra Rupa. So he's already identified the Vishwarupa, then why is he asking, who are you? So it's like, suppose, you know, we are just going for a walk with a friend and we've known that friend for many years and suddenly some thugs pound upon, pounce upon us. And then... Our friend suddenly exhibits some martial art moves and all those ten thugs are knocked down on the ground. I ask, who are you? <laughs> so, when we see some unknown dimension in a known person, then we ask, who are you? You know, who, who, like sometimes a, per, a person behaves, a person is very, maybe very introvert and very reclusive and suddenly that person says, yeah, I'll come to your party, I'll come to your uh, Vyatara, I'll come to your this. Say, hey, who are you? And what have you done to my introvert friend? Where has he gone? <laughs> so, when we see something new in somebody family, something familiar, we ask, okay, what is this? Who are you? So, that is the question. Arjuna knows that this is Vishwarupa, but this Kala dimension is not seen. And that is why, what is Krishna's answer? When who are you? He doesn't say, I am Vishwarupa. He says, I am Kalosmi Lokakshay Krut Pravadho. Kalosmi. Time I am. Now time does all three things. Time creates, time maintains and time destroys. But specifically on the war field, time has come to destroy. And therefore, Kalosmi Lokakshay Krut Pravadho. I am come to destroy the worlds. And then, this is the only section in the Bhagavad Gita where Arjuna offers prayers. You know, this is, he is seeing the Virat Rupa and he offers prayers. After that, that chapter ends and then Arjuna, as I said, the moral of the question answer series is going on now. So Arjuna has a question that at the end of the 11th chapter, after Krishna shows the Virat Rupa, he shows that, he again come, shows the Vishnu Rupa and then he comes back with Vibhuja, Krishna Rupa. And he says this Krishna Rupa is the rarest. The Virat Rupa is rare to see, but Krishna Rupa is the rarest to see. Sudurdarsham idam rupam devapyasya rupasya nityam darshana kangshina. Even devutas long to see this Rupa. So that is the 11, that is the end of the 11th chapter. So at that time, Arjuna has a question. Okay, you just said that the form that pervades all of existence materially, the form that contains all your manifestation, that contains all of existence materially, that is subordinate to your personal manifestation. Then what about your manifestation that pervades all of existence spiritually? Which is the spiritual all pervasive manifestation? Brahman. So which is higher? Is that higher or is your personal manifestation higher? And Krishna very categorically declares that 
it is a personal manifestation that is higher tesham aham samuddharta not only is the personal manifestation higher worshiping the personal manifestation is also better for us because the, that personal divinity intervenes and uplifts us so then that ends the 12th chapter and then at this point again now the most difficult to trace link between a question and what comes before that is in 13th chapter 13th chapter arjuna suddenly asks question that kshetra kshetragya purusha purvakuti now there is nothing about kshetra kshetra purusha prakriti in any of the previous chapters at least the immediate previous chapters so as i said this is arjuna asking questions he's already had see arjuna was they were existing at a time when the sankhya philosophy was very widespread and so now krishna has heard arjuna has heard what krishna has spoken and arjuna wants to know okay in what you have explained just now how does the sankhya world view fit in so just like we may have heard something say we may be somebody might be uh, very devoted to nationalism and we talk about parabhakti okay how does nationalism relate with parabhakti so i know something how does it fit with that so that's why when arjuna is asking about six terms he's not only asking about those six terms he's asking about the world view underlying those six terms so krishna explain those six terms and then in the next chapter he introduces the three modes of material nature so these six terms they are answered in third in chapter then as a part of sankhya so generally when a person asks a question you can answer the specific question or you can answer the and address the underlying intent in that question so arjuna is not interested in just terms over there although he is asking about terms it is not a reason to have to apply for ex, appear for exam where he has to give definition of those terms the terms are indication of his desire to know about the underlying world view so krishna explains a fundamental element of that sankhya world view and that is the modes and then when krishna hears krishna speaks about the modes arjuna actually has a question If the modes are binding us modes are entangling us then how do we go beyond the modes how can we know who has gone beyond the modes that's so that we can follow the example and there now this from the 13th chapter onward it said this is the gyana section of the bhagavad gita the first was 1 to 6 is karma section 7 to 12 is direct bhakti and 13 to 18 is gyana section so in that section what happens is krishna tells arjuna that how through gyana you can come towards bhakti that's why in the 14th chapter also krishna says yeah, the modes are entangling but the way out of the modes is mam cha yo vicharena bhakti yoga in sevate so bhakti yoga he emphasizes then at the end of the 14th chapter krishna uh, that question is answered but krishna continues speaking explain the sankhya world view from another perspective that is the upside down tree urdhva mula madha shakam that is the 15th chapter and then after he describes this 15th chapter and there also he brings in bhakti quite categorically after that he talks about okay what are the bottom and top parts of the tree there's a daiva and asura sampada and so in the 15th and 16th chapter there are no questions and at the end of the 16th chapter what happens krishna talks about two extremes that those who yah shastra vidhim utsrujya vartate kama karata so he talks about those who reject shastra and act according to kama that is the asuri and then those who follow shastra and regulate their karma tasmat shastram pramanam so he talks about these two categories so the arjuna says what about those who are in between ya ya shastra vidhi mutsrujya vartate shraddhayan vitah tesham nishtha tu ka krishna sattvam aha rajastama so it's like see generally education begins with black and white uh, like if somebody want to teach a child about colors okay this is black this is white they are easy to recognize but if a child all that a child recognizes black and white and never comes to learn shades of gray then the child's education will be incomplete but if you start with shades of gray only you know this is light gray this is dark gray or oh, really child will get confused so you start with black and white and then bring in shades of gray so that's what krishna starts with black and white and then arjuna asks questions about shades of gray and then krishna says okay then how do you know what is the level of faith of those who are not necessarily following shastra so this is uh, he says that look at how they live look at how they live so and the how we live can be seen by what they eat what kind of sacrifices they do what kind of charity they give what kind of austerities they perform now here when talking about krishna talks about yagya dana tapa it is not just specific rituals it is in general how does one belong to the universe so broadly speaking dana refers to how one belongs to human society are we just taking from human society or are also given to human society yagya refers to how we belong to the universe we are taking so much from the universe 
what are we doing in return for the universe? And tapa, in one sense, refers to how we belong to the body. We are uh, we are living in the body, but are we simply using the body for our gratification, or also, or also engaging in some discipline for men, for the health of the body? Then at the end, 18 chapter is the last question. So here, in one sense, this is a summary. So Krishna, Arjuna wants to get a conclusive understanding. That is, okay, he says, I want to know about the tattva of Tyaga and Vairagya. So that is what is the actual truth of renunciation and of the renounced order. So truth, Prabhupada translates as purpose. Truth, you know, what is the truth? What is the true purpose of those things? So these are the 18 questions in the Bhagavad Gita. This is a quick overview of the Bhagavad Gita. So in answer, answering the 18 question, Krishna actually does an overview of the entire Bhagavad Gita. It starts from Karma Yoga, which is, uh, which is described from say chapter verses 2 till verse 48. 49 to 53, he talks about Jnana Yoga. And then 54 to 72, he talks about Bhakti Yoga. So that's why the 18 chapter is sometimes also called as the summary of the Bhagavad Gita. 